Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. RAF typhoons fire in defence of Israel as part of a multinational operation to stop Iran's bombardment with ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and drones. A former fighter pilot describes the threat posed to the pilots. There would have been so many missiles in the air, deconflicting not only away from those missiles, but also from your other friendly forces. That would have been a major challenge. Luckily, very high tech radars, very good coordination from external uh, agencies to enable that to happen. So how did so many countries cooperate to stop almost all of the 300 missiles hitting their targets? And why were they needed? Mike will give his analysis along with Simon Newton. The armed forces put a lot of effort into leadership training, but what about the other side of the coin, the followers? The Army Center for Leadership has produced a new doctrine note on the whole concept of followership. And if we get people talking about it and recognizing it as a term, it, even for a private soldier straight out of basic training, imbues in them a sense of responsibility to follow well. Plus. And he famously, came up to the boat and my dad said, what is it? And he said, it's a tank. And my dad said, what, you know, a water tank, an oil tank? And he said, no, it's, it's an army tank. We find out how the discovery of an American tank on the seabed off Devon led to revelations of a highly secretive and tragic exercise of the Second World War. Zitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. The Royal Air Force has been drawn in to defend Israel after Iran's unprecedented attack launching some 300 missiles towards it. They included more than 110 ballistic and more than 30 cruise missiles, as well as at least 150 drones. They were fired from sites in Syria, Yemen, and for the first time, Iran itself. As part of Operation Shader, several jets and air refueling tankers were dispatched to the region and typhoons destroyed a number of drones. They joined a multinational operation involving the US, Jordan and France with cooperation on tracking from Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, Mike, um, how was this attack by Iran stopped? Uh, well, Kate, by a, a multiple range of means. So pretty well everything was involved. There was uh, Israel's own missile defense, uh, which is fairly considerable. That was in operation. The American Navy uh, had two destroyers, uh, the Kearney and the Ali Burke in the Eastern Mediterranean. They brought down some ballistic missiles. There were aircraft up uh, from uh, uh, Israel, uh, United States, of course, Britain, France and Jordan. And they were all bringing down drones fairly regularly. They brought down by my calculation, about 100 or more of the 170 drones. Um, others were brought down by missiles. So it was a multi-layered defense. And what was interesting is what, when we looked at the, the numbers a couple of days afterwards, it was clear that the Israelis couldn't have done this on their own. They did it because this alliance came together at short notice that was land-based, sea-based, operating from the air among a range of countries. And as a result, these 330 odd missiles and drones that the Iranians set off, only seven of them got through uh, to the Navatim air base, which is symbolically quite important, but only seven of them made it through. So that was a very high hit rate by a multi-layered, multinational defense force. Big question, of course, can that be done a, a second time? Well, Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell is a former fighter pilot and former commander of the Harrier Force. He told SITREP about the complexities of the air operation. It does throw up a whole load of different problems in the simply in the time available, detect those drones, then track them, then target them. Each of those is a different challenge. There's also hundreds of them pouring across. The, the Typhoon only carries a limited number of missiles, so it was a coordinated effort between the Israelis, the Americans and the Brits. Who takes which targets and how do you find them? How do you make sure that when you shoot them down, they don't fall over other people's territory? For example, most of these you want to track and target long before they get to Israel, and therefore you're targeting them probably in Jordanian airspace, Iraqi airspace. That means coordinating with those countries. It is at night. It's an unfamiliar environment. Uh, and these Shahid drones aren't easily picked up on radar. They're not fast, they're not metal, they're quite difficult to identify. Um, so a really professional job by everybody involved. 
Well, let's bring in our Ukraine reporter, Simon Newton. Uh, Simon Newton, a professional job, envied by Ukraine's President Zelensky, who says they should receive the same protection from Russian drones that was afforded to Israel by the UK and U- the US last week. Why can't the two conflicts be given the same treatment? Oh, hi, Kate. Well, yeah, yeah, well, it's a very obvious question, obviously, and you can see why President Zelensky would ask it, particularly after you know two years of enduring this this onslaught from Russia. But there are a key number of differences, I suppose. One is the sheer size of Ukraine versus a relatively small area of Israel, which allows Israel to have this layered air defence. And the key one, of course, is that the, the airspace over Israel is uncontested, effectively, whereas in Ukraine you have Russian air power, you have S-300, very potent and uh, effective air defence systems. And for Western air forces to go up against them is a very different challenge from what we saw last weekend. Um, Israel's allies, as we saw, can operate their warships freely in the Med to protect it, which isn't the case around Ukraine because the, the Black Sea's closed off bec- uh, since Turkey closed off a couple of years ago. So the question you might ask is, you know, why don't the Israelis give Iron Dome to Ukraine? Well, Ben Wallace actually says he asked that very question, I think. But Tel Aviv said they, they don't want to do that. They don't want to upset the Russians. So for all these reasons, there are they are very different scenarios. Um, but Ukraine very firmly believes that, you know, there are double standards at play and they see this as a lack of will on the part of the West, not really of, of capability. Uh, Mike, you said earlier um, that in terms of the attack on uh, Israel, that uh, it couldn't have done it alone, that it needed this coalition. Why wasn't its Iron Dome enough? It, yes, partly because of the relative sophistication of the attack. I mean, first of all, the attack came in an arc of 180 degrees So it came, at Israel. So it came in from the north, came in from the east, came in from the south. You know, the Houthis at the bottom of the Red Sea were firing uh, drones up into Israel. Um, that was the first point. Second point is that the attack was sophisticated in the sense that drones and cruise missiles set off before the ballistic missiles. So it was a phased attack, the drones intending to overwhelm the defences and then some cruise missiles to get through and then the ballistic missiles, which were really what the Iranians wanted to land, 120 ballistic missiles, they were, they came in the final phase. So if you look at it, it was a, it was a multi-directional, multi-style attack and Iron Dome is only designed to protect Israeli territory above Israel. It's really, it was designed against, effectively, rockets from uh, Lebanon and from the West Bank or from uh, Gaza. It can go wider than that, and the Israelis do have a more multi-layered system. But the, the essence of thwarting this attack was to bring down those missiles and drones as far away from Israel as possible. And that's what they did. We should also bear in mind the fact that, as always with military victories, there's a fair bit of luck involved. The Israelis were lucky because about half, maybe 60 of the 120 ballistic missiles that were launched malfunctioned. Mm -hmm. So the, the ballistic missile threat was not as great in reality on the night as it was intended to be when the Iranians pressed the button. And Mike, the Iranian authorities have said this was a limited attack. They could have done much more had they wanted to. To what extent then was it um, a strategic attack that they wanted to ha- perhaps uh, map the Iron Dome for intelligence? Well, they might have wanted to do that, um, but they clearly wanted to get more through than did. I mean, the fact that they got seven ballistic missiles through that did minimal damage to an air base is, gives them a propaganda victory, but it was trivial. And a lot of people in the Arab world, those who don't, don't, don't want to uh, just take in the propaganda, realise that this was very much a thwarted attack. I think you know, the, 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 the Iranians certainly didn't want this attack to look completely... Uh, unlimited and so they informed a lot of allies ahead of time that it was going to take place they telegraphed it but clearly if they'd only wanted a symbolic attack they wouldn't have used 330 odd missiles and drones in such a coordinated way they intended to do far more damage to Israel than they actually did Um, were they mapping Iron Dome so they could do it again well possibly But remember, they can't do it again quickly. It takes some time to put that sort of attack together. And next time they'd have to try to do it differently. So it's not the sort of thing they can do every week. It would take them, you know, another few weeks, I think, to be able to get together the material and the intelligence to do something else. And in that time, of course, the Israelis will be tracking exactly um, what the Iranians are doing. And Simon, you've just been to the think tank Rusi to find out about the UK's ground-based air defence. If the UK faced an attack like Israel did from Iran, are we well enough prepared? 
Well, I think the conclusion of the, of the paper is that, as it you know, as it stands, we don't have that sovereign capability. We don't have an Iron Dome, uh, as Mike was talking about there. But you know, there are caveats, obviously, because it's unlikely we'd be targeted in the, quite the same way as Israel. We'd have a whole host of Allied air defences to call upon. You know, if Russian bombers started flying in from the east. But I mean, that said, this report focuses on ground-based air defence systems, or GBADs as they call them, which mm-hmm. the army operates. And it looks at what they need to have to deal with this this evolving threat of FPV drones, cruise missiles, even hypersonic missiles. So the army's getting has got six Sky Saber systems that which are very good at tracking cruise missiles. We were told, but they only have a range of forty kilometres. Two of them are in the Falkland Islands. Um, I think another one's in Poland. So there's the whole issue of where you put the others, which key infrastructure, you know, which military targets do you protect. So it sort of says that this this it concludes really that the army needs to be much more plugged into a very upgraded command and control system so that it can pull in data from a whole host of, um, mm. of sources, not just UK ones as well. And actually, you know, we asked the question, if you're going to start from scratch, which, you know, what would you do? And they, they pointed to Poland. Now, Poland has just invested four billion uh, four billion pounds in a system. It's going to have it's going to have a hundred um, air defence uh, missile systems launches and and I think a thousand missiles or so. And that is the sort of level of protection that you probably would need if you were going to be dealing with a, a situation like we saw uh, the weekend in Israel. And Simon, the paper you mentioned there that that's the, the requirements for the command and control of the UK's ground based air defence. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you've also been finding out about the new laser system plan for the Royal Navy's fleet called Dragonfire, which will shoot down drones and missiles. Could this help against this kind of attack? What do you learn about that? Well, this is, re- you know, this is really interesting. We went and saw this at Port and Down the other day. It's going to be fitted to Royal Navy ships in 2027. Um, it's being brought forward five years earlier than it, than it was originally planned. Um, and it's a big grey unit. If you imagine the sort of top of R2-D2 looking with, uh, you know, if you imagine a huge great car shaped, a car sized version of that on top of a ship and it uh, it works by shooting out um i think it's a 55 kilowatt laser beam that can heat metal up to about 3000 degrees so the headline you may have read about this is that it can hit a one pound coin from yeah. about a kilometer away and we saw lots of melted drones that they'd shot down using this laser and there was even a, a 120 millimeter mortar shell where they'd managed to burn a hole straight through the casing of this shell and set this mortar off so it's a, it's a very powerful weapon itself. But to your question, I think the answer right now is probably not largely because it's a, it's a line of sight weapon, a straight beam. So it can only reach mm-hmm. out as far as the horizon. And that obviously degrades the further away the target is. And of course, it has to have time to track a target so the laser can do its work, if you like. I think it takes about five seconds to explode that shell. But in time, could we see this used against ballistic missiles, you know, perhaps with a, a land-based battery of these lasers? And the impression I got talking to the companies involved is that is certainly something they think is feasible and you know this is a whole new realm of weaponry a game changer to use that slight cliche but that's what they say it is mm. one that many other countries are chasing but the uk at the moment is actually right at the front of this uh, technological pack simon newton good to speak to you thanks very much news discussions and analysis this is sit Now, serve to lead is the motto of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. The armed forces put a lot of effort into leadership training, but what about the other side of the coin? Followers. The Army Centre for Leadership has been researching a concept called followership and produced a new doctrine note on how it could benefit the service. Before we hear how it could be used in the Army, let's get a brief overview of what followership is from Barbara Kellerman, one of the leading authorities on the subject and whose work helped inform the new doctrine. Followership is the converse of leadership. So let me begin by saying that leadership inevitably is a relationship. There is no such thing as a leader without a follower. So to look at leaders without looking at followers, to look at leadership without looking at followers has never made any sense to me. I always think, and I've written about this, not of leadership as a single individual, but as a system with three parts that are equal. Part Mm. one is the leader, part two is the follower, and part three is the context within which leaders and followers are embedded. Cannot understand leadership without followership and without understanding the context within which both inevitably are embedded. So what does followership look like? How do you create it? 
Well, it's not that you create it. It exists just like, you know, it exists because some people are leaders and some other people are followers. The question is, how do you create good followers who are engaged followers, who are supportive of good leaders and who are not supportive of bad leaders? I wish followership would be given the same amount of attention and education as leaders. In fact, I relate it to being a good citizen, to being participatory, but not necessarily approving of someone who you feel is in some way behaving erroneously or even wrong. The trick is to create followers who are supportive when things are going right, but who have the courage to speak up when things are not going right. So what is needed to grow good followership? I would say the first thing is consciousness raising, meaning being aware that followers not only exist, but that they matter. And I would say that good followership now requires, above all, understanding the integral importance of followers to leaders, the integral importance of good followership to good leadership, and giving followers some stake in the game, that they understand that they are not trivial, that they are not subordinates in any sense of the word, except along some kind of hierarchical ladder, that they matter. And if they feel they matter, they will generally behave accordingly. Barbara Kellerman, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Well, let's speak now to Lieutenant Colonel Dean Canham, who is head of the Centre for Army Leadership. Great to speak to you. Why is the Army interested in followership? What can it do for the service? Well, thanks for having me, Kate. The Centre for Army Leadership did a fair amount of research into what has mainly been an academic discussion on followership previously. It's not something the Army, as you say, is familiar with. And having done the research and some thinking on it, we realise how much positive progress can be made with looking at followership as a as a topic in its own right and how it links in with leadership. And, and the outcome from that was a doctrine note. The basis of it is if we accept that everyone in the army is a follower all of the time, whilst some of us are leaders some of the time, then we realise that there's a whole army cohort that can be engaged on followership as a skill and if it's a skill like leadership which can be taught and learned and practiced then we can all be better at it and if we are all better followers supporting leaders then that should have benefits for the whole organization so can you give me um some examples of of what this means in practice yeah so i think if you look at some of the skills character traits and the like of what we would deem exemplary followers, things like being responsible, being mission focused, confronting issues, being trustworthy, using initiative, being values driven, those sorts of things. They all look and feel a bit like really good leadership traits as well. And so where we seek to train some individuals in leadership some of the time, if we're training everyone in those sorts of traits and characteristics all the time not only are you getting people to follow more effectively you are actually generating the skills that are required for good leaders in the future as well and people can move between these roles following and leading very quickly usually several times a day and in fact some people just in their methods of following can switch between types of followership depending on who's asking them to do what, how much they believe in it, how enthusiastic they are about it, etc. And so you can move around on the followership scale several times as well. And if you want followership to be part of the army, you need soldiers at every level on board. How would you explain it to a private who's just out of basic training? Uh, so our point would be, firstly, to, to recognise it. And if we get people talking about it and recognising it as a term, it even for a private soldier straight out of basic training, imbues in them a sense of responsibility to follow well. Perhaps otherwise, people would not self-identify as a leader, even though at the most junior level, you could have private soldiers finding themselves leading in short, small tactical scenarios. And 
it, it imbues a responsibility to act as a good follower. And if everyone is being proactive in how they follow, a lot of that could be in supporting leaders as best as possible to achieve that shared mission or task, then actually it energizes the youngest or most junior or most experienced soldiers and officers to take action, realize they have responsibilities specifically as a follower, even if they don't identify themselves or aren't appointed as a leader. And so it's about making sure people realize they have got something to add and they have got a responsibility to act. And being a good follower is a really useful method to communicate that message to people. How do you maintain that command structure and ethos where people do what they're told if you're also encouraging a consent-led followership? Yeah, so you, you might be familiar with the phrase mission command, which effectively says that what we will always seek to do is tell people why they are doing something and what the outcome needs to be, and then allow them to get on with it rather than micromanaging them through how they're actually going to achieve it. Followership absolutely underpins mission command, and it will make mission command a whole lot more effective. And it's already a, a well-trusted and a known part of our doctrine. So followership underpins mission command absolutely. And we've also incorporated, there's only one short annex on the followership doctrine there, and that was on challenge, and where we exist in a very hierarchical organization, perhaps challenge, especially up between ranks, could be perceived as particularly difficult. But if mission command is to work well, and if we're to encourage a culture where the appropriate challenge at the right time is a positive aspect of the command and leadership relationship, then, then that will also be a positive thing. And perhaps we might iterate challenge as a concept in the army a bit perhaps it's a, a culture of offering views and knowing how to receive them well is a better phrase a, a culture where people are expected to offer their views and opinions at the right time and you probably have to spend as much time teaching people how to receive the offers of ideas as well but most organizations recognize that as entirely healthy you put a lot of work into this and you have have more planned. Um, how do you hope followership will improve the army? If we see a culture in the army that recognises good followership, supporting great leadership, if people are having a healthier, happier time in their work, day to day, particularly in training, then on those days of operations, whether it be any type of operation from war fighting to peace support to United Nations type of operations, then you will get a better product. The Army's fighting power will be greater from having better general work relationships in and amongst and between all of its people. And that's what we aim to do with all of our work. That was Lieutenant Colonel Dean Cannon, the head of the Centre for Army Leadership. That is just some of what we discussed, and you can hear the full conversations with both Dean and Barbara about followership in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast online. Uh, Mike, is followership a concept you've ever really considered in your career? <laughs> yeah, well, somebody said to me years ago, and it turned out to be very good advice, they said, don't take your boss problems, take your boss solutions or possible mm. solutions to the problem problem you're talking about. Don't just go in and say, we've got a problem. You go in and say, there's an issue here. I was wondering about this or this or this. What do you think, boss? And it made me realize that there is a sort of social contract between followers and leaders. And that's exactly what this concept of followership is all about. You know, the so a social contract which good followers make with good leaders. And you know, the, the best example, I was just thinking about it now, that I can think of immediately in the military sphere is General Slim, Bill Slim in Burma. Mm -hmm. Um, because at the beginning there was nothing but defeats in 1942 and Bill Slim was a corps commander of Alexander. Alexander was the army commander of the army of Burma and they were chased out of Burma with the Japanese snapping at their heels into Tamu in India. They simply had to get out and it was a dreadful retreat, 900 miles, the biggest, longest retreat the British Army's ever conducted. And Bill Slim was in charge of the rear guard. His corps was the rear guard, so he came in last into Tamu 
in the monsoon and his mm. corps trailed in and he said he watched them come in and they were like scarecrows mm. they were like they were you know desperately short of food and everything he said and they, they were like scarecrows he said but they they were in their units and they carried their weapons and there was a parade the day afterwards after they came in you just pulled them all together and he was he was moved to tears and completely baffled because this this army that this corps that he had they were british indian they were nepalese they were burmese and they cheered him they'd come in from a terrible defeat they were on their last legs and they cheered him as their commander because they realized that he didn't waste their lives he conducted the rear guard properly and so leaders and followers in that case had made in those desperate days of 1942 they'd made that social contract between leaders and followers got a feeling it's going to be in your new book mike <laughs> yes oh yes it's all there it's all there <laughs> now when a tank was found on the seabed off devon in the 1980s it brought worldwide attention to a highly secretive but tragic exercise of the second world war on the 28th of april 1944 thousands of american troops trained along slapton sands to prepare for the d-day landings in normandy but a tragic turn of events meant hundreds of U.S. Army and Navy personnel lost their lives. As the 80th anniversary of D-Day and Exercise Tiger, as it was known, approaches, Bryony Williams has been to Slapton Sands. So there were actually various places in Devon and Cornwall that were used for Allied training during World War II. And like any big military tasking, when it came to Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings, they needed somewhere to practice working together and to train. So Slapton Sands is a three-mile shingle beach um, in East Devon, and running parallel along a large proportion of it is a freshwater lake. So this location was picked as a training area because of the strikingly similar topography to Utah Beach in Normandy in northern France, which has a steep shingle beach and has marshlands and waterways running alongside it. So for this kind of preparation for D-Day landings, that's why Slapton Sands was picked for this. And these particular uh, preparations, it was called Exercise Tiger. Can you tell me more about it? Yes, yeah, so tens of thousands of American soldiers and sailors were involved in what essentially was a big dress rehearsal amphibious landing on Slapton Sands in the spring of 1944. So on the shores of, of Slapton Sands, to make it as realistic as possible, live ammunition was used to give soldiers the sounds and smells of what it would be like in northern France when they were doing it for real. So as troops were moving up the beach due to a communication failure and timing issue, live shelling actually claimed the lives of hundreds of Americans on the beach. And then in the early hours of April the 28th in 1944, you, um, eight U.S. tank landing ships were making their way from Lime Bay to Slapton when they were torpedoed and attacked by undetected German e-boats. So two LSTs were sunk and one was badly damaged and it saw over 700 Americans died. So tragic events, but arguably what was most tragic is that no one knew about what happened really until decades after the war ended. So at the time, General Eisenhower who was Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, issued a, sec a secrecy order because it saw some of the men who lost their lives had detailed plans regarding Operation Overlord and they didn't want the Nazis to find them. It's also thought that this huge loss of life on Allied soil would be demoralising for those who are about to take part in the D-Day landings. So the secrecy order was lifted in the summer of 1944, but many of those involved in Exercise Tiger were still too afraid to talk about it. It's incredible uh, to think that it, it happened this way. And you met a very interesting character whose father was the heart, at the heart of this very secretive exercise, actually becoming very well known. Yes, yeah, so I, I met Dean Small, who still lives in the Slapton area of East Devon, and it was really down to the work of his late father, Ken Small, who helped shed light on exactly what happened on a beach in a fairly remote part of Devon all those years ago. So Ken Small recovered something quite unusual from the seabed just off the coast of Slapton Sands. Um, and here's how Dean Small described it to me. 
his curiosity got the better of him and that's when he discovered um, that there was something on the seabed three quarters of a mile off the shore that fishermen would snag their nets on and he couldn't understand why the fishermen didn't want to know what it was and eventually after a degree of pressure a good friend of his a local fisherman um, said that he would dive down and have a look and see what it was and he famously came up to the boat and my dad said what is it and he said it's a tank and my dad said what you know a water tank an oil tank and he said no it's it's an army tank so quite astounding really that an american sherman tank was discovered under the water in a, in a fairly sleepy corner of devon and of course then came the questions of well, well how did it get there why is it there whose is it and it only really was because of this discovery that people started to come forward with their stories the tank was eventually pulled out from the sea to the land in 1980 and it's become a memorial to those who lost their lives during exercise tiger so here's Dean Small again my dad was really moved by it um, immensely so it had a real effect on him and I think like many people he, he could imagine what it must have been like on that night you know you, you had hundreds and hundreds of young very young most of them 17 18 some lied about their age and were actually 16 and there they were in Lime Bay not really knowing what was going on. They knew they were practicing, but they didn't know what for. It was two o'clock in the morning approximately, and then all of a sudden they come under an attack from, from German e-boats. And um, it was, uh, uh, I've spoken to veterans and some of them even said they thought it was just part of reenactment, that they were just making it more real. So, um, Brownie, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about how more of the details of this tragic exercise became more widely understood? No one believed them because there wasn't any evidence. There wasn't anything that anyone could show them that this has actually taken place. But, of course, with this, the discovery of the tank, that gave people almost like a hook that actually, no, I, I am telling the truth. This did happen. This is the tank. So it, it became a, a symbol, really, for, for people to come forward and to share their stories. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, lots of veterans uh, who survived were afraid to talk about it. And it's, it's thought that the lessons learned on that tragic night um, of Exercise Tiger actually helped Operation Overlord be successful. Um, so all these people that had taken place that weren't allowed to talk about it, and then you have the success of the D-Day landings, it, it all felt a, a little bit strange to those who were part of Exercise Tiger. So I met um, a veteran from the Royal Tank uh, regiment Dave Lomax and uh, the tank regiment became involved because at the time when Ken Small was looking for people um, who knew about getting a tank out of the water he kind of looked to the tank regiments um, to, to try and help him so Dave had a, a long affiliation um, to this story and Dave Lomax um, he described just why it's so crucial for people to prepare for any military operation. Like with any operation, you've got to rehearse, rehearse. And I think, fortunately, this offered them a great opportunity to go through the drills. Imagine the guys, you know, coming out waist deep or sometimes neck deep and then having to push their way up through. And it's not sand, it's actually ankle deep shale, which then just grinds you down. So you just can't imagine it. So mix up in communication on the actual rehearsal day when the Navy were firing too late, when the guys were on the beach. And, from that, uh, massive lessons from learn, and they and they do say, in a way, if that hadn't happened, maybe it would have been far, far worse on D-Day. Uh, Mike, um, so there will be commemorations to mark the 80th anniversary of Exercise Tiger, and although it did go tragically wrong, um, did it really make an important contribution to the D-Day landings? Yes, I think it did. It, it, I mean, it showed um, the importance of communication and how everybody had to understand absolutely what their role was and then have a plan for when things went wrong. Um, it also emphasised the risks and it, and it did, um, as it were, put into the whole D-Day planning an extra sense of 
care about what they were doing. And, you know, it, it was covered up for so long because it was such a tragedy. I mean, when the e-boats got in among them, that was an absolute tragedy. And, it, of course, it showed if an e-boat detachment had, had got into the invasion flotilla, what, de what uh, uh, destruction that could have wrought. And, you know, when we celebrate uh, D-Day, because it, it all worked out better than might have been expected, and because it was um, such a huge logistical exercise, we always talk about that, we tend to pass over the sheer risks. I mean, you know, the big, it had to be on a, a completely um, a full moon night for the paratroopers. An aircraft had to fly low and slow over the drop zones to drop them on the night of the full moon, making themselves very, very vulnerable. It had to be a night of very high tides because the water level had to be high enough to get the landing craft over all the undersea obstacles. And those landing craft had to be launched from four and five miles out. So these vulnerable landing craft, which could have been swamped just by a high swell, were not traveling 200 yards to the beach, they were traveling four and five miles to the beach. Some of them were tanks with canvas sides traveling four or five miles in the swell. Um, it, it would have been so easy for a, a quarter or a third to the force to have just drowned before they ever reached the beaches. And so I think we should be aware of the risks. They were so aware of them when it came to June the 6th, 1944. And as we celebrate the 80th anniversary, we always celebrate the triumph of it. But we should also be aware of the, the enormous risks. And, you know, Eisenhower had already written his speech, If the Thing Failed. He had his mm. words written out and he put them in his, his tunic pocket and he carried them around with him for several days as a sort of a, a, almost as a, a, a talisman that he wouldn't have to open his tunic pocket and read them. Mike, thanks very much. And thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. Until then, you can always catch up with past programs you might have missed online at bfbs.com slash sit rep, the Forces News YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. 